Well, Malcolm, thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. And it's uh, thank you all for honor, honoring me tonight at this spectacular gala. But it's really the Hope Funds for Cancer Research that we're honoring for providing fellowships to outstanding postdoctoral scientists who are the lifeblood for the future of cancer research. So my most important thanks is to you for funding them and supporting them. Let me tell you about three experiences that demonstrate how perseverance, good luck, and taking risks can impact one's career and life. First, perseverance. As a sophomore at Harvard College in the spring of 1956, I decided to go into medicine. I had never th really thought about it. And I sought a, la a lab position in the biology department without success. I was told we're full, come back in the fall. But I persevered and revisited the department number, a number of times, begging for an opportunity. And the secretary told me, there's a new professor from England that just started a lab. He's only 28, but he's supposed to be very good. It was Dr. Jim Watson. <laughs> so I knocked on his door, offered to help him unpack, and I was able to convince him to take me on. And I was his first undergraduate student at Harvard. I received an incredible introduction into biomedical research in his laboratory, obviously. Incidentally, he told me not to go to medical school just to get a PhD. But in those days, 80% of the grants from the National Cancer Institute went to MDAs. Today, 80% go to PhDs. It's, it's a different world. Now, my second uh, little vignette is good luck. In 1961, there was a huge three-foot weekend blizzard in Boston closing the streets to all traffic. To reach a party in Harvard Yard in Cambridge from Harvard Medical School in Boston, I had to hitchhike a ride to get to the subway on a lonely cinder truck holding tight. <laughs> Actually, I would have skipped the party except for a late phone invitation to meet a super duper blind date. <laughs> she turned out to be not at all memorable, but as I entered this party alone before picking up the date, I observed and introduced myself to a happy, vivacious, and beautiful young woman named Anne, who was only there because the street closures forced her to cancel her trip to the Vermont ski slopes. Now, I had only five minutes to introduce myself, invite her out for the next Tuesday, and dashing off to pick up my blind date. All very improbable, but Anne became my wife of 54 years. Will you stand, Anne? <laughs> now, taking risks. <clears throat> In 1980 at UC San Diego, I decided with Dr. Gordon Sato to pursue a novel hypothesis that we might be able to inhibit cancer cell proliferation by producing a monoclonal antibody which would block the binding of a growth stimulating molecule, EGF, to its receptors on the cell surface, <clears throat> thereby preventing EGF from activating the receptors tyrosine kinase. All of your honorees are in the same field. Now, the simplest way to describe this to you is the receptor is like a lock on the surface of the cell, and the EGF is like a key. And when the key goes into the lock, it sends a chemical signal, <coughs> and it stimulates proliferation. And the antibody was going to be a piece of chewing gum in the lock so the key couldn't get in. That was really how I described it. At the time, the tyrosine <coughs> kinase molecules that mediate many biochemical signals in the cell and monoclonal antibodies were new. And at that time, my lab was studying lymphocytes, which are one of the few cell types that lack EGF receptors. So this was a novel experiment, and it would require a great deal of retooling of my laboratory. My grant proposal to the NCI was rejected. Too risky. 
but we scrounged for funding, persisted with the help of two fabulous postdocs of the type that you're funding here tonight, and we published the first evidence for the efficacy of a receptor inhibitor and a, and a protein tyrosine kinase inhibitor to prevent tumor cell proliferation. Our work contributed to initiating a whole new approach to cancer therapy that is commonly exploited today. With strong subsequent funding from the NCI, once we published that, followed by a productive collaboration with a biotech company, and after overcoming a number of logistical hitches, which I won't go into, but uh, the company Imclone, many of you have heard about for other reasons. Our monoclonal antibody, Herbitux, was approved by the FDA and it's prescribed today in the clinic for treatment of a variety of cancers. And I want to close by thanking the many mentors, collaborators, and postdoctoral trainees with whom I've worked and from whom I've learned so much over the past five decades. And now I want to go off script and talk about Malcolm Moore for a minute, because he's the hero tonight. Uh, I had a lab right near Malcolm's for 11 years at Sloan Kettering, but I want to tell you about my first knowledge of Malcolm Moore. In 1970, uh, when I began my career uh, running an independent laboratory, a book came out describing the hematopoietic stem cell. Stem cells now are really hot in cancer. It's cancer is started by aberrant functioning stem cells. And the first stem cells that were described in the 50s and 60s were in the blood system. And it was chaos. Nobody knew what, how to put it all together. So th there's two things about this book. One is, at age 28, 28 years old, that's when a lot of these postdocs are starting, Malcolm wrote this book with a man named Metcalf. It's Moore and Metcalf. I think he wrote 90% of it. Summarizing the world's literature on this field, organizing it in a way that anyone could understand it. And uh, the other exciting thing about this is, it's the first textbook I ever bought that cost over $100. <laughs> so I hope you got some royalties, Malcolm. <laughs> Malcolm admitted to me that a lot of his students Xerox the book. It's much cheaper to Xerox that book than to buy it. But it was a fabulous book, and it showed me 15 years later when I met him what a comprehensive mind he has to synthesize information and apply it and do the great work that he did. So I want to ask us to applaud Malcolm. And thank you again for this wonderful honor.